Hey, you're with the Galactic Cafe. And Generally Nerdy. And today we were privileged enough to sit down with Terrence Zedunek and Sar Hendelman, the brilliant musical minds behind Repo, the Genetic Opera, Devil's Carnival, and most recently, American Murder Song. We're going to talk to the creative duo about their creative process, as well as what are what are some of the uh, things that led them, led them up to these projects and some of the social uh, issues behind the projects. Um, just don't forget to where you can find us, facebook.com slash Eclectica Cafe. Twitter, our handle is at Eclectica Cafe. And, and you can look for us on the YouTubes if that's not where you're watching us right now. Yep, just iTunes. search for Eclectica Cafe. We're on iTunes. Search for Eclectica Cafe. Uh, or all of the generally nerdy stuff, same way on uh, Twitter. It's generally underscore nerdy. And on Instagram, generally nerdy, all one word. And uh, also on the YouTubes. We just want to emphasize, as usual, that it, it means a lot for us, when, for you guys to... Help us get this content spread around as much as possible. We don't ask for any sort of monetary compensation for this. We don't do this for any sort of monetary compensation. So it's really helpful for you guys to pay us back essentially by liking, sharing, retweeting, reposting, whatever. So thanks a lot. And, uh, and uh, enjoy the show. Definitely. Zedunek, Sar Hendelman. Um, how did you two... All right, so anyone who's been a fan of Zedunek's work for a while, Terrence, uh, uh, Repo, uh, between Repo and Carnival, you met up with Sar somehow. How did that happen? Well, firstly, uh, you're mispronouncing Sar's last name. It's Hendel Main. <laughs> That's a really unusual that, spelling for that. The <laughs> <laughs> There's not even a Z in it. That's that's crazy. Anyway, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's more of an itch at the end. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm saying my last name right, but who the hell knows? I got the information from my daddy, and we know how trustworthy he is. Let me work out Well, actually, Sar and I, we we've been friends. Um, they're sort of collaborative admirers for Christ. It's almost 20 years now. So life is, uh, time is fleeting. And life is is awesome, especially when you get to collaborate with your friends. Yeah, so we, we've known each other before, I think even before we started Repo. Or sorry, the yeah. stage back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think shortly after we met, I was doing the two-minute operas. Uh, right. So I was kind of a solo performer and piano vocalist in Los Angeles. We sort of go to each other's shows, sometimes begrudgingly, I think, because you know, <laughs> when, when you're trying to get something started, you rely on your friends to, to come out, and so you're not performing to two people. Right, <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> I've been there. 20 people. But, uh, <laughs> At least it's so 20 and not two. each other's indiv independent uh, shows, yeah. individual shows, and then eventually got together to collaborate. Um, well, we, we collaborated on Repo. Sar played a lot of the piano tracks on oh. the soundtrack. Interesting. And then we collaborated in a writing perspective for the first time with Devil's Carnival 1, and we've been working together as writing partners ever since. Very cool. Uh, Sar, uh, you have not been just doing music for a while. Give us a little bit of background what you were doing before uh, to make ends meet. I've been doing music for a long time. Actually, so. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I started out. Uh, I had my own, my own band, my own project. Oh, nice. And to uh, some film music. I started working with Terrence. We uh, you know, did some. Uh, uh, the carnival. And then here we are. <laughs> um, Alright, so I had a very interesting issue when I, was, when I went to go see American Murder Song. Uh, the American Way, my apologies. Uh, 
my issue was because I, I work with some people and I have some friends obviously who are familiar with Repo and kind of familiar with uh, Carnival. Um, I couldn't explain to them what American Murder Song was aside from just a collection of really good songs. So how in that situation would you describe American Murder Song? Yeah, and like while you're, before you go into that, it, maybe if you want to just explain what a murder ballad is, because I don't know if many people are, you know, the layperson is very familiar with this, and I, I personally kind of equate it to Sweeney Todd, and I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's, that's something I would compare it to. I think Sweeney Todd is a musical that has a, a murderous storyline or a character more so than actually being a murder ballad. So a murder ballad traditionally is a song that involves murder. Um, usually it started as a folk form of art um, in Europe, primarily in England and uh, over there, and then moved to America. Um, kind of a cautionary morality sort of tales. I mean, some of it's about the killers, some of it's about the people who are past Away, but it always involves murder and it always involves some consequence to somebody. Right. And, and a lot of people may not be familiar with the genre as a genre, but I think most people are familiar with murder ballads, whether they're aware of it or not. Yeah. I mean, almost probably half of Johnny Cash's songs were murder ballads. Gotcha. Um, and a lot of pop songs are too. I mean, a couple of years ago, um, Humped Up Kicks. That too shit. Yeah. People was probably as popular a song as there was that year. And that was basically about a school shooting. So it's, as long as the narrative of the song involves someone dying <laughs> by killing, by intentional killing, I guess, um, it is a murder ballad. So, so the subgenre of a murder, murder ballad, though, doesn't necessarily fit into show tunes. It's not like mutually exclusive with show tunes, right? Though, right? Show tunes are, I mean, I think they're kind of two distinct different things. We might have show tunes that are murder ballads, and, you know, uh, but, but it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, a murder exclusionary. It's a narrative tale oh, okay. that focuses on murder. And it's usually one, it's usually contained in one song, well, specifically it's a murder ballad, whereas a musical or a show tune, it's a series of songs that right. tell a bigger story. So, yeah, I mean, like, Repo has murder in it. Yeah. Well, but, but it's not a murder ballad. I wouldn't consider the songs in Repo Murder Ballads. Um, but I think for us specifically, we're interested in not only the idea of telling dark stories put to music with American Murder Song, but um, specifically when we started researching the history, the, the folk and the oral storytelling traditions of Murder Ballads, we kind of nerded out on that and really got into you know, what, what's the difference, between, for example, between a European Murder Ballad and an American one. And the differences are very pronounced and very distinctive. So we sort of ran in that direction and the project ended up becoming not only a series of songs that tell a bunch, about a bunch of different murders, but it kind of became a, a story, a collection that tells the story of the birth of our country in some ways. And it's some of its foul deeds in getting there. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it, uh, so, well, that's just real quick. That's okay. kind of that's very significant to American Murder Song is that it takes place in 1816, which is known as the year without a summer, right? Um, so, how does that kind of fit in? Because you mentioned the birth of the nation, etc. How does that fit into the overall narrative of the, of your story? I think that you know, in researching what we wanted to do and what era we wanted to kind of place this in, we gathered around a lot of different ideas, but uh, I, I'm not sure that what you would call what, like, this collection of song as a narrative right. would be a direct story. I think it's more vignettes that each of the stories inform a certain movement or a certain kind of arc. Um, you know, some songs kind of fit into like the birth narrative of the nation, and those are in our EPs are more of the kids' songs. Uh, some are more into kind of how um, how you grow up and then how you live life and the, you know, how you die and what the consequences of that are. So I think it is narrative, but I think it's more conceptually narrative than right. specific narrative as a whole. Each piece of it is narrative and forms that part. And that year, there's just a lot of really interesting things happening that year. Um, the year we had a summer was a very, you know, uh, 
from a climate sort of thing had a lot of impact. And those things really reshaped the country in a big way. You know, so when you had the you know, even like what I said, Ohio fever, it was people, right. the climate destroyed parts of the country, people had to move west. And that started a movement of saying, you know, we actually deserve to move west. We deserve everything that happens here. So I think all those ideas are ideas that we try to explore. Um, through smaller uh, the smaller characters that kind of are emblematic of a bigger thing. And specifically that year, because it, it you know, at that, in that time, America was primarily a group of farmers. You know, most Americans were farmers. So when you're struck with effectively snow during the summer, right, right. your crops all die and you die if you don't find a way to get really resourceful. So we found in that sort of backdrop, not only almost a, a feeling of divine judgment uh, hitting the nation, but also something that showed, okay, here's a country that when hardship comes, they get ugly and sometimes they get murderous, but they actually persevere. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I, I, I didn't, I didn't put that much thought yeah. into the depth behind yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> and actually, I mean, I, I appreciate that, and I think that that's very, very valuable because you're you're essentially giving a really important history lesson. And a lot of times I think that we get very, very stuck in the present and, and sort of wallowing in the, what we consider to be problems now, which a lot of people would say are first world problems. So you guys are doing a really good job of presenting something that happened in this country that a lot of people aren't really aware of and 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 sort of you know taking a look back at you know this yeah maybe some of our struggles right now are significant but this is what you know your ancestors went through and 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 giving a giving a really great history lesson in a, in a really entertaining way well thank you i mean hopefully kind of like what you just said when people listen to it or they come to one of our shows the first thing they're not smacked with is i better bone up on my history hopefully they just like the music because <laughs> yeah, is good yeah and they like to dress up, and I mean, you came out, so you know, Dustin, that yes. our audience is very, um, very participatory and participatory, <laughs> and very great. So they um, they dressed up, oftentimes in historically appropriate garb, uh, to come and be a part of the each night. So it's very much there, and it's very much part of the setting. But I think ultimately, you know. We're not, we're not trying to write songs that, um, you know, to get a PhD. We're right. trying to write songs that hopefully move people emotionally. And, uh, and, if, and if in the process you can give them a little bit of history, or, or for us even, I mean, we didn't know a lot of this stuff until we kind of dug in there and started reading about all these fascinating things that happened in that year. And you're like, oh, that'd make a great song. Right. <laughs> well, we're trying to earn a PhD by writing this shit. <laughs> The problem is nobody's going to give us one, and we're, we're not going to give one to each other. So it's not a it's a futile effort. Maybe Trump University. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's worth a shot, right? Yeah. Um, so, American Murder Song the, is the vignettes. Uh, going back a little bit to, I, I'm going to juxtapose a little bit your your musical direction of Repo versus the two Carnival movies. Um. In Repo, uh, there were obvious. It was it was a little bit more traditional of a musical, in that you had musical themes that kind of centered around certain characters. Whereas the Carnival movies, uh, it seemed more a collections of a collection of songs that told the same story. Um, was that because of the decision to go more episodic for the Carnival movies, or was it a conscious decision at all? Well, I think it's a mix, and if you don't mind if I jump in for a second, Sar, I think that um, Repo being more like a musical, and, and specifically being something where there's very little dialogue, right? Um, you really don't have score in the way that you do with Carnival and sure. a lot of musical films. So with Repo, there's kind of singing throughout, and there's music throughout, and so as such, Perhaps some of the musical mo motifs are a little more obvious, right. but in Carnival, there's actually a lot of motifs, specifically in the score, um, and that's really Sars' purview. So, which I think is some of the the coolest stuff in there because it is something that you really only get if you listen to it a few times through and you start catching some of the stuff. But um, but Sars, please, I, I don't want 
yeah, talk I mean, about think, some more. <laughs> I mean, I think that's more so with uh, the second carnival. Um, yep. Alleluia. Yeah. Yeah, There's the score is honestly, I think over half the score is music from either songs in Alleluia or in the original Devil's Carnival. They're just hidden. Um, so you kind of, hopefully you get enough of that feel without kind of screaming it out loud. Right, right, um, right. And I think also with, with Carnival, when, when we went to write the songs for it, we made kind of a conscious choice to stray from the idea of a regular musical. And that, that didn't mean to not have songs, obviously, because it was <laughs> songs all over the place, but the, the songs just function differently. Um, so in a normal musical, people sing about, you know, they have a high moment and they sing about their feelings. Mm -hmm. Nobody sings about their feelings in, in The Devil's Carnival. So in the first one, it's every song is kind of an aspect of performance of one of the people or, you know, it just, it's not, it's not about kind of how they feel at that moment. It's kind of like this, this carnival ride that's happening to them and the ride is the song. Um, and when we went to Hallelujah, we kind of struggled with how do we keep that going? Um, because it was, I think, in part what was so effective with just the music section of how it worked. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, we kind of said, well, this is God's world for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, you know, everything has to be as a tribute to God, it's an ode to God. So again, the songs aren't about feelings. They're all sort of like, here is this great, this great overseer, and this is how we uh, this is how we pay tribute to him. All aboard! All aboard! Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> again, more on the filming side of things. Uh, Paul Schrader, uh, legendary director, so on and so forth, uh, recently said on Brady Sinellis' podcast that uh, the state of the movie making industry is as such that you can't afford to shoot anything that isn't going to be in the final product. So a director is forced to, and his quote is, shoot to the bone. Uh, does this ring true? I know you guys are a little bit more guerrilla style, uh, especially with the carnival movies. Um, but does that ring true? Was, was there much that didn't make it into either carnival movies? I know there's some songs that didn't end up in Repo, but that's more from the stage production end of things, and it changed drastically from being a stage production to the movie. Yeah, I mean, as you said, the fact that we're sort of guerrilla filmmakers, some of those rules of how you shoot and what you shoot are, are a little bit thrown out the, the window with us. It's, but... Because it's a musical, um, you do have a certain formality that needs to take place. And that's because, as opposed to a regular film where you can just kind of grab dialogue on the spot right. as the actors are saying it, in our case, the, the music, the songs at least, are recorded in advance. Mm -hmm. So the actors basically record their songs a couple of weeks before filming, and then they have to essentially lip sync back their own performance right. and make like it feel like they're doing it. Yeah, like a music video, uh, but with, with a story, I guess, or a longer form <laughs> story. But, you know, I mean, yeah, there's definitely, there's less money, and it seems like there's less and less money to do things. So, Very much. but that said, it, it actually makes a lot more work for the writer, maybe, because we would, we would have to write, because things, you have a certain number of days, basically, is really more what it comes down to than... So it's like, how do you accomplish what you actually need to tell the story in those limited number of days? And as such, if you know a scene, or in our case, a song or songs might end up getting cut, you actually don't film them. And in the case of, um, of both The Devil's Carnival and Alleluia, especially Alleluia, we wrote, I don't know how many songs that ended up they were there in the script. They were there on the demo recordings that we did. Um, yeah, I think it was like three or four songs for Hallelujah. I think there was even more before that, but the three or four that ended up, like they were all the way down to the finish line. And then through looking at the budget, looking at the days we had, uh, and looking at the locations and the availability of the cast, we had to make some very difficult decisions just to kind of go in and say, those songs are never going to be as opposed to maybe film them and see if there's a way to make them work right. or have them as some kind of bonus feature somewhere. There just was no reality to that because we would have been compromising 
the scenes we knew we needed. Uh, and we already had not enough time to do those. So. <laughs> right. I remember, <laughs> I think, I remember it, you, you go. Well, if I can just add, I think the, when you have something that's a, that's a musical, um, it has a certain flow to it. Right. So, it, you know, to say, okay, we're going to do the scene that's going to lead up to a song and then not do that song just doesn't work. Yeah. So a lot of times what you have to do, you don't have the, you don't have to be really smart about it and say, if, that, if we're not able to do that song or we can't do that scene, then either that song is out, that scene is out, and then how do you make everything else work so the story doesn't suffer? So it's not all of a sudden you, you've missed something and then might require ratcheting up another song a little bit. <laughs> um, so it was... Kind of course. In, in, the, in the process of the 10-minute operas that eventually became Repo, did those 10-minute operas kind of help you hone what works and what doesn't through that process? Yeah, I mean, in a roundabout way, for sure. Um, even though I know Repo's well, probably my most popular work, it's also the one where I kind of feel I was learning a lot on the job that didn't really become totally useful until later projects. Sure. Um, because I think with Repo, the whole way was kind of figured out as we go. Um, and in many ways, we didn't even know where we were going. Sometimes it was just, we're doing a play right now, or we're doing a 10-minute opera. And we just want to have fun tonight and do a good show. And then, oh, we're continuing now. We're doing it as a, a one-act show. And now we're doing it as a two-act show with an intermission. Now we're doing it as a... So it, as such, it was so schizophrenic in that way. <laughs> that I think there's stuff in the final film that had, had it been approached with a little bit more understanding, <laughs> uh, it might not have ever been. Um, that doesn't mean it's better or worse. It's just, it's a different way of, of approaching. Whereas I think with both carnival films and especially with American murder song, we kind of went in with like, here's, we were able to draw the target a little more accurately right. and then really try to sharpen our knives and, and, and hone whatever voice and whatever vision we were doing to hit that target as opposed to drawing a target that, I don't know, was on four different walls. <laughs> <laughs> and the walls were moving and it's, bending. You know? So that, that plays into your vignette videos that you've been doing for Murder Song too. then, yeah? Well, yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's crazy to think, and, and I hope this is a testament to that we're, we're aging like wine <laughs> as opposed to like bread as artists. Um, so American Murder Song, in, in, in many ways, at least certainly to me, and I think in the way that a lot of fans are receiving it, they're feeling it's coming out in the same kind of way and gives a similar experience as some of the other projects. But we've only been out in the public with the murder song since March. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it's been a super dense journey, which culminated in the tour, which ended a week ago. And if we sound a little haggard, yeah, our eyes aren't focusing. It's because we're, we haven't really taken a moment to recover from it. We got a, a little bread here. Move. A little bread. A little bread. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we've been working on it for over two and a half years. Um, maybe even longer now, but, but it's only been in the public for, and, and actively for roughly six months of kind of continuous short form content. So even though things, some things changed and we had to modify on the fly, for the most part, we had a vision. We sort of mapped it out as smartly as we could and as creatively as we could and set to it. So even like with all the video vignettes you were talking about, they were all filmed in two days, two and a half oh, days. Wow. So we had to know this is what six months from now looks like with the project. And this is how it leads into the tour. And then hope, and then how the tour leads into the next step, which is what we're working on now. And, and we're very excited because we've got some, um, some murderous stuff up our sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I kind of wanted to go back you guys a little bit to when we were talking about guerrilla filmmaking and guerrilla, basically artistry. Um, also on the Brett Easton Ellis podcast, Rob Zombie was on, and he talked about how nowadays a movie like uh, Devil's Rejects would never get distributed by a major film uh, studio, and and that just being the climate of of filmmaking nowadays. And Repo probably wouldn't get put right, by anyone in right, and nowadays either. So which, thankfully, Lionsgate took it, but unfortunately, Lionsgate took it. 
So, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> continue. Sorry. So, I mean, basically what my question is, is what's it like to create content nowadays in 2016 with so much content being delivered online, basically skipping the major studios, cable TV, etc.? Um, does this kind of does this allow for more creative freedom, or does it also hinder you guys by not being able to get the funding you need for your projects as much as you maybe like to? So, I mean, is it kind of a give and take as far as that's concerned? I think I think it depends with that because um, on, the, on the one, and I think this is kind of with any sort of art form, is the more you take it on yourself and the more you are in control of it. The more you get to, you have the limitation of the finances or maybe ability um, and and reach and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you get the the opening up of control. Um, so in in some creative ways that can be great. You know, uh, we can with this project we're able to deliver it in a way that I think if we had a bigger thing we wouldn't have been able to deliver it in that way. You'd have more so think, masters. Exactly. So I think it's a it's a balance of obviously you want to get something done, you want to get it done in the way that is the most creatively fulfilling and artistically fulfilling, and also in the way that you can get it to to as many people as you can who will dig it. You know, so uh, it's getting it to the right audience and and getting to do with it what you want to do with it. So I think it's it's a balance, and the more the more you have. Um, a business end to it that you don't control, then that just shifts some of those equations. Right. Uh, rarely does it do you get all the business end support and all of the creative all the support creative. stays with you. You know, so um, and with specifically with American Murder Song, um, you know, what we've been able to do is kind of put out the vision that we wanted to put out and run the the business side of it in a way that actually makes it streamlined you know so we're able to kind of move and adapt because sometimes if you can't adapt it it's becomes a real problem and uh you know so in that sense it makes it easier obviously the more money you have the more you can kind of do with it right so i think it's a balance of those things i think the real trick both on a personal level and i think just generally when it comes to artists trying to get their work noticed seen or heard um, on the one hand, for us, we have a problem in the sense of I would love to be able to think condensed, um, <laughs> but it seems like everything we do is grand, you know, so it's like grand costuming. Just even doing a musical is more expensive and, and grand than just doing an independent film that just is dialogue. And then, you know, we're like, okay, we're going to do an independent project, but it's 1816. And... <laughs> You know, we need all these visuals and costumes and and uh, instrumentation from the era. So, because we're doing stuff that sort of requires a higher production value, it's hard to just go and just shoot it on a whim or right. record it on a whim. It takes a lot of of work and it takes a lot of capital. The rub is that people aren't well. There's there's just so much content available, and I'm even. I suffer from it, you know, like I used to, even though I hated the fees, I'd love going to Blockbuster and actually making an event Absolutely. of getting a movie or yeah. a movie. And I take it home. And even if it was bad, because I had made that effort, unless it was just God awful, <laughs> I probably would make my way through it. I'd say it sucks. I'd take it back and I'd be up for the journey again. Now, even with stuff that I kind of really enjoy, I watch it if, 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 in my best days, which means I have time and I'm maybe 20 minutes at a time, yeah. which is to say I'm not valuing it as much yeah. as I used to. I find myself I think, doing, doing that an awful lot as well, where it's it's almost it's definitely content overload where, you know, several years ago, you kind of for lack of a better word, you kind of had to settle for what was either on, you know, basic cable or or like you said, going down to Blockbuster and browsing the shelves, which is something I miss incredibly. And. You, you, I mean, you found pleasure in it in one way or another. You maybe it was the camp of it or whatever, but it's like now it's there's so many options available. It's really hard to settle on something because it's like, well, this is good, but there's probably something even better. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be completely content with what I'm doing right now. 
and and you pay a lot less for a whole lot more. Yeah. Right, right. So you know, just it's not even about greed. Just just do the math. If if you're trying to do a high production film, musical or or concept Space album, production. music group, um, you're just not going to generate the money that would warrant the cost of all that production value because people are just as happy to watch a YouTube video in someone's basement than they are to plug into something that's really visually spectacular and, and all of that. So I think, I'm not sure what the answer is, and we're constantly struggling to find a way to make it all work and still be creatively true to ourselves. Right. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that we've tapped into is a touring aspect, <clears throat> and this is true both for the films and, of course, for American Murder Song, which is you kind of have to be there to get it. And even when you were saying when we started this conversation, I didn't quite know how to explain American Murder Song. On the one hand, we're not trying to leave people scratching their heads. We're not trying to be right. co confrontational in that way. But on the other hand, there is, there is some design to say, get your ass out there and trust that it's going to be something you can't just watch sure. at home. Sure. That was trying, I think what I was trying to convey to the people was like, just come with me. You'll see. It's, <laughs> I can't put it into words. It's yeah. so unique. Well, in the way that you described that about, you know, like so much people being able to create content and put it on YouTube and you're essentially competing with some guy that's in his basement as opposed to, you know, you guys creating this amazing work of art. God, the, uh, the millionaire YouTubers all yeah, basically make their videos. In the I basement. mean, like you can equate that to modern day journalism where like everybody can be a journalist now and there's there's literally no gatekeeping anymore. And people that really, you know, put the, 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 the effort forth in getting this, this education are competing with people who, you know, just want to rant and rave about some bullshit issue or, or whatever, and there, there's no credibility there. So, I mean, I guess that's well, how I would equate it. You can't, you can't blame, I mean, the audience is going to watch and like what they like. And so, and as creators, you're going to like to make what you like. So the trick is always to find the balance. I mean, I'm with you. I, I would use some of those harsh terms as well, but clearly they're doing something right and they're reaching an audience. So it's our challenge as an artist to go, as artists to go, how do we do the same, but, but do something that we think is of a higher production value. Maybe perhaps there's a social commentary. Perhaps it's something that, like you, Dustin, you said. I mean, you've been following this for almost ten years, right. and you trust that. You trust that when we come out with something, even if you don't understand it, that it's going to take you on a ride. That's going to be just a little bit more than all the white noise. So you know, I, I, and that makes me so proud. You know, as a, as a creator, because as a as a fan myself. Um, it's those type of works that I love. So if I can deliver the same. Um, but then sometimes I go, man, Sar, why can't we just write a song that's just a fucking song, but all you need is an acoustic guitar and a uh, video. Uh, <laughs> we took a concept with this when we said 1816. We're like, let's get a bunch of cats, put fucking monocles on them. <laughs> and then we realized we didn't have a basement. Yeah, we said, you know, we, all we need to do is get them to play the, the keyboard. Yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> and then we realized we actually need to play the fife, and that's just not going to work. It's, it's just, it's difficult to train a cat to play a fife, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, would you guys be idea. willing to take a question from one of our listeners who just hit us up on Facebook? Please, please, bring it yeah. up. Okay. Uh, so, Cat asks, speaking of cats, <laughs> that, yeah. What up? Anyway. Uh, Kat wants to know what drives you to be creative. The nilest scientist in me would argue that it is a biological impulse to raise your social status and thus secure a more desirable mate. <laughs> Terrence is laughing. You can't see this right now, but Terrence is laughing as you say this. Anyway, continue. <laughs> but life is probably not all sex and survival instinct. There must be something more to being a, an artist. Sorry. <laughs> Take it away. Have it on side. <laughs> it's the inability to do anything fucking else. <laughs> <laughs> because I just have this creativity flowing through me, huh? No other talents. No <laughs> other abilities. I mean, don't discredit yourself. You are fucking talented, sir. Both of you. Very, very fucking talented. No other talents. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, back to the other line of questioning. Um... Feel free, feel free to tell me to fuck off with this question because I know this potentially is a box of worms, uh, Pandora's box of worms, if you will. Um, 
is there, I know you, because Terrence, you posted that very cryptic blog post about the carnival and about the, the previous tour, which I saw you do Alleluia. I saw you on that tour and uh, I, I thought it was brilliant. Anyway, it's a side note. Um, is there still a potential for a third carnival movie? Uh, is there any sort of anything you can give us that might be slightly less cryptic than your blog post? And again, feel free to tell me to fuck off. If I can actually be less cryptic, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, firstly, I, I, I didn't I didn't know the blog was cryptic. I, I thought it was rather it, candid. But, I just but you it was right. it was more candid than you had been about it. Yes, but I just felt like there was you were you. I don't know. There was a, there was a, a something in it that I was like, well, so what happened, and why are we maybe not going to get a third? Well, the answer to your first question is, in terms of there being more carnival. I mean, anything's possible, and and it's, hope is not all lost, no matter what goes on. Because, I mean, the beautiful thing um, is, if the business of various things falls apart, or Something just really doesn't work. Going to the former question that the uh, <laughs> so I was asking, the meaning of artistic life is we're never going to stop creating. Right. And no, so I don't think so. Until until we can't anymore. You know, we lose our minds, or we're we're in the ground, or we become the subject of our own murder ballads. Uh, <laughs> That's our ultimate goal. <laughs> but so anything's possible. And to that end, Sarah and I have even talked about you know maybe down the road of finding a way to release some of the the tracks and such that that exist or were ideas for further storylines, even on our own. Um, so there's always a possibility and there's always a possibility that people figure out how to get along and, and make the project continue, which is what we'd all would like. Yes. The reality, and this goes to kind of what Sar was describing earlier about, there's always a concession. And when you have maybe better business, um, more money, more whatever, then sometimes the creative suffers and then vice versa. When you have a lot of creative freedom, the business sometimes suffers. And, and unfortunately, by the end of Carnival 2, the two sides were just not on the same page. Fair enough. And some really stupid decisions were made uh, that I wish I could have affected a different outcome of. But... Um, it just, it left, it, it, it kind of made that tour very difficult and it left a lot of bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Now, that said, we love the project. I mean, hell, Sar and I spent more time on it than anybody. So we <laughs> right. clearly love the project. Um, I mean, we spent years crafting that those worlds and the characters and the music. Um, and so no one is more hurt by it than us in that regard. Uh, and we're aware that there's, we're very lucky. We created a legacy and there are fans who love it and who want to see more and who have devil's carnival lyrics or characters tattooed on their fucking bodies. And we haven't forgotten about them. Um, and so we're doing everything we can. We hope in the meantime, no matter how devil's carnival ends up shaking out that people will check out American murder song, because even though it's different, it has a lot of that same stink that you can't put your finger on, which is dark stories put to music, unusual worlds, and I think something that inspires community. Um, and so we aim to keep doing that, no matter what the project. A beautiful dark world. All, all three of your projects. I've, I've, I very much am in love. And like I. Uh, my father and my little sister watched Repo oh, separate from me. It was They just saw it on the rack somewhere and was like, hey, that looks interesting. And they unfortunately didn't like it at all because they're not into darkness, I guess, is a fair evaluation of that. Um, so when I told my dad I was going to be doing this, he's you're going to talk to that guy? I mean, he's probably really talented, but he's really talented and he makes that movie. Um, <laughs> but like, I, it, it's 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 the darkness that that draws everybody to it. I feel like the the one freckle, the, I can't think of the name of the song. One freckle, one freckle, three freckle, four is the line. But like, it's it's that kind of darkness that I think is is that un that untangible that you were just talking. What about. what's what's appealing about the macabre to you guys? 
<laughs> I don't know if I even look at it as macabre, personally. I mean, I just, says yeah, macabre. I mean, I, to me, I think, um, and I think we get to the same place from diff very different angles, um, but I just kind of like the gray. You know, I like when stuff isn't, you know, happy or sad or good or bad, you know, that it's kind of like just really complex. And I think that's just kind of human nature. Right. Um, so, and, and I think sometimes when you start really digging into that and then trying to get into things that are not necessarily the prettiest, it gets uh, classified as macabre or dark, but I think it's just kind of human nature and probably just things just more interesting. You, you, you better uh, yell at those guys on Wikipedia because apparently they say you said that it's macabre. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, dismissing that word as to describe yes. it. Just, uh, um, so uh, uh, there, has, there have been others who have lost a financial backing, I guess, like Joss Whedon with Buffy. He continued, once, once the show was no longer on, he continued it in comic books, and he did the same thing with Serenity. Um, Kevin Smith is now doing the same thing with Mallrats. It's turning into a TV show, although he's got to probably rename it because he doesn't own the name anymore. Um, is that a possibility? You guys are both artists. Uh, Terrence, I know specifically you do uh, visual arts, and, and you've done storyboarding and, and things like that. You have a freaking comic book. Um, I'm not, uh, do you do the visual the stuff so much, sorry? I do amazing, uh, stick figure drawings. <laughs> but is that an option though? Like, is that a, is that a, a potential future for things that maybe are tied up in litigation otherwise? Uh, I mean, anything's possible. I think I'm glad that you compare us to Joss Whedon and Kevin Smith, but. Oh, how could I not? Like, <laughs> well, honestly, well, there's a major, the quality. We maybe agree, maybe some of the aesthetic, but I think right. Joss, Whedon, Joss Whedon, Buffy was a network, a successful network television show. Correct. Um, none of our projects have had that sort of um, exposure or money. But with with the uptick of nerd culture, like an, an indie comic uh, has just as much potential to be as successful as an indie movie, I feel like, No. Sure, but but I guess probably one of the major differences, and, and I don't know, I haven't read it, but I'm guessing that Joss Whedon has a team of people that that's their job, and especially <laughs> the artists. And, um, you know, if in this case, this would be entirely on our shoulders right. to do it, which would mean there'd be no time for American Murder Song. Touche. Um, so, but anything is possible, and, and truthfully, going down that line of thinking, um, while it certainly wouldn't be up to me, or ultimately up to me, I would love to see something like a Repo comic or a Devil's Carnival comic, even if I had nothing to do with it, you know, other than it's inspired by these characters that we collectively created, um, especially if it was good. <laughs> so um, I realize you can't always control that, but I think a lot of times these, these comic book spinoffs of movies and of television shows, there's just a production mill that does that. Right. And my gut is... Kevin Smith, uh, Joss Whedon, they probably write a forward and walk away and collect money. <laughs> so we're no, no. And look, no one's made me that offer to say, here's some money, write a forward. Right. Uh, and if they did, I would take it under consideration. But as of now, no one's made that offer. <laughs> I'll, I'll interject on that. If I can add, I can't draw, but I can also write a forward. <laughs> Just because you are forward does not mean you can write one. <laughs> so you guys both have had very eclectic careers. Uh, Terrence, you, you know, I've been a storyboard artist for Sony and even uh, on a Sean Penn directed project into the wild and transitioned into freelance where you even collaborate, where you could, uh, collaborated with Darren Smith on the gallery and, and as D Dustin uh, mentioned, the comic book. And looking at that, I've always wondered, myself, I've always aspired and fantasized about the idea of being a, uh, a full-time artist. And the idea of being of making your living as a freelance artist is something, sounds exhilarating, but also terrifying as hell sometimes. Like, So what's it like depending on earning a living working from gig to gig? Are you ever 
concerned about being able to you know create another project again that's, you're putting a smile on his face <laughs> that's yeah that, well, I'll, I'll just say this and and uh for anyone that's, that's sort of done it you're never it's never enough you know your ideas are always bigger than your budgets if you have a budget at all um oh god and your work is always apparently less valuable to others than you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> and less and less. Yeah, exactly. So the Tell reality is, um, that. Yeah, oh God, yeah. <laughs> the reality is, you know, I, I guess I've been lucky in that I've, I've got to work even if they're in very briefly on some projects that people have heard of, but it's always a struggle. And I mean, even with American Murder Song, to get it off the ground, Sar and I, I mean, we spent a year looking for money and not a lot of money. Just, I mean, not compared to like movies. Right. Um, to get it off the ground and we all, we ultimately went to some friends and and got them to put a little bit in to help get the thing off the ground. So you're never resting comfortably. Um, and it is scary because, especially when you go out on the road and you go, okay, we're gonna do a tour and we're gonna do 35 cities, which is what we ended up doing with American Murder Song. Before doing it, I had no idea how much it cost <laughs> to do something like that. But it's a lot more than I think most people realize. Yeah. So even though you may have awesome audiences, which we do, who come out and really do support. I mean, you know, we, like I said earlier, we have a community and, and we're so proud to, to have fostered it in whatever way that we have. Um, and our, so our fans are very dedicated and very loyal and they do come out when we ask them to. But again, we're not talking about a network television show that's reaching millions of people. We're talking about a, a show <laughs> with eight people in a van uh, sharing hotel rooms, driving into a venue, like a small rock venue, and putting on a mini concert slash theater event, and hoping that at the end of the day, even more so than making something, you're hoping you can get enough to fund either your next project or the next phase of the project that you're presently working on. Yeah. Like, and even with Repo, uh, you know, even though it's something a lot of people know now, that was never the case. You know, when we were going on the tours, Darren and I were paying for it, you know? And mm -hmm. I, so it was never a situation where you're going, oh my God, the money's stacking up and <laughs> I'm so lucky to be a working artist. It's more like I'm an artist who works. Right. And works hard. Do you ever, I guess, get, I mean, because whenever I play this scenario out in my head of, of being a full-time artist, do you ever, are you ever afraid of the idea of, you know, having to just go back to working in nine to five and, and deal, I mean, how do you deal with those levels of uncertainty, you know, like that your art is always going to be there for you? Well, I think you're assuming that, that we don't have to do work sometimes that we don't want to do right. to make right. a project. Fair and enough. sometimes it's still artistic. You might go, okay, you need to get someone to build something for a project you're really passionate about. And you go, okay, I will do a trade of services to get that done because we can't afford to get it done. Um, and and that's, that's the good end of it. The bad end of it is you take gigs or jobs or things that you have no interest in doing. Not worrying yourself out, basically. But you do it because you know it, it leads to the next step, which is it helps to pay for what you do love doing. So it's never a situation where you're just kind of like, I mean, not yet at least. I hope that changes one day. But as of now, it's, it's always like, how do we get to the very next step? Sure. It's never like swimming in the the gold like Scrooge McDuck. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where you got Scrooge McDuck into that. That was awesome. <laughs> good good uh, but, reference there. You know, when but, I was a little I will kid. Add, I will add to that this idea of fearing that it'll always work or right. not always work. That actually should never be part of the equation. I mean, if it doesn't work, you got to figure it out. And if it does, then you got to figure it out because it's not going to, you know, unless if you really hit something, really fantastic, which hopefully you will, you know. Um, but for most people, even really, really successful and comfortable artists, you know, you got to keep doing shit. You can't, you know, you don't hit that thing that, you know, very few people are working that level where they hit something 
and they're set and they can do whatever they want to do. And that's actually in most jobs, you know? So um, the, the worry of whether you're still able to do it in a month or in a year or next week is really kind of besides the point because it's actually not going to get you anywhere. It's a, it's a, it's not only a waste of time, it's a real obstacle because then you have to actually think, you have to spend your time figuring out what am I going to do in that case? And then you can't actually do the work you're trying to do. So, uh, you know, sometimes you eat a little more ramen and, uh, <laughs> Little you know, and, some, and sometimes you put, uh, you know, but so what, basically what you're saying is the, 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 the potential flipping burgers is really not something you consider uh, just, to, just to play an old trope, right? It's, it's, it's I'm an artist and so this is my life and the rest of it is irrelevant, right? I mean, it's not the rest of it is irrelevant because it can be practical and a necessity, but as an artist, you're going to push in a certain direction. Gotcha. And the more that you can make it work, the better, you know, and if you can't, then at that point you got to figure it out. But, you know, if you got to flip a burger, flip a burger. But yeah, and I, and I think we both know several working directors who have day jobs and yes. not day jobs like film industry day jobs, day jobs. Interesting. Um, so I think that I think there's always a the fantasy or the perception versus a reality is seldom the same. Yeah. But I think just to echo what Sar says, like I've known many people that had way more resources at their disposal than I have almost every step of the way and they don't do anything. And then we also know people that have absolutely nothing and they're constantly striving. And um, I think if it's not in you to just do it and work that hard, no matter what, it it's probably wouldn't matter if you had resources. You yeah. probably wouldn't be able to do anything with them. Very astute observation. Um, so, touring. This is uh, a little more on the social, socially conscious thing. Uh, I saw, like, like I told you, I went and saw the Alleluia tour. Uh, obviously, I met you guys at the American Murder Song tour. Um, whether or not you remember it is, I don't know, because a you, you meet a lot of people, and there was some very beautiful women there that night, if uh, you remember correctly, Terrence. <laughs> and B, obviously you meet a lot of people, like I just said. So, um, one thing I did notice about your touring group, the, the people that you take with you, um, there is a lot of women. Um, is that a conscious decision or does it just kind of happen that you get along better with, with females? I think we actually had an awesome, well, and and it's not it's not a, 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 a note on the quality of anything because obviously it, it's it's brilliant. I I'm a huge fan, so I'm not trying to like minimize anyone's role or anything. I don't think we hired women on this tour to hire women. Um, you know, we've had discussions to the sense of like it, it, it's interesting to see more diversity, um, and it's and women bring a different energy. People bring a different energy, right. no matter who they are. So um, so in that sense the more inclusive or the, the more diverse it is, it becomes more interesting. Um, and, and I think actually funny enough um, th that we had a lot of women on the, on the crew yeah. side of things, yeah, yeah. you know, um, which is not just, something you see as a musical tour. Yeah. So, I mean, they're just, they're awesome people. They get shit done in a really, really great way. Um, and why not? Scully's a rock star, by the way. Anyway. She really is. Yeah. <laughs> well, interestingly, and maybe this is just a tell in the sense of because people are not used to seeing women um, as road crews or as roadies right. as much as they're used to seeing men, it may seem like we're really stacking the deck that way, but actually this tour was half and half. Yeah. Huh. And Sarah and I are two males. So, yeah. um, so it, was, it was literally half and half. So maybe it seemed just because you're so not, not used to seeing it. Right. But no, and, 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 and you mentioned Scully, who's our tour manager and, uh, and friend, and we've been working with her for years now, and I've been working with her for several projects. She's just the fucking best at it. Yeah, I, I mean, it has nothing to do with her gender. In fact, um, her real name is Kelly, and she uh, oftentimes she books the, the venues for us and deals with people through emails. And they just assume she's a male because she has an androgynous name. And you really see just 
overt sexism because even when you say, here's Scully, she's our tour manager, they'll still go look for a male to get yeah. an answer as though she wasn't just introduced. And so on the one hand, that makes her a badass and we like really defending her and vice versa, she defends us. But um, look, you know, it's like we like working with people that are competent and Scully is uh, yes, the, best. the best tour manager and, and, we've, she, really and she just got hired on a very big tour for another project um, because she's that much of a badass. So, um, so yeah, Scully for president. <laughs> um, I, just a small anecdote to piggyback on that. I, I was in a band for a very long time and we had a female vocalist and uh, it's a heavy band and we, we would go to some shows and bouncers wouldn't let her in with us because they would tell us girlfriends aren't allowed in with the band. Like just cause she's cute doesn't mean she can't make heavy metal dude. Uh, literally almost had to uh, get an owner for a venue to come down and approve her to come in because she's our fucking vocalist. Anyway. <laughs> well, look, I mean, we, we cast Elisa White Glues from, from uh, Glues from uh, Arch, Arch Enemy, Enemy yeah, yeah. to play Free Lavinia. Yeah, yes. Clearly, you know, what's more metal and female than her on the scene? Right. As well as... Um, Chibi from Birthday Massacre. Yeah. So they are they are rock stars and badasses, and we're actually we're the lucky ones. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they yeah. should see us like the <laughs> we are. Um. So uh, again, kind of piggybacking on that for the next question. Uh, in the first Devil's Carnival, when you were playing with Aesop's Fables, um, the character of Tamara, uh played by Jessica, I really wish I could pronounce her last name, I'm going to butcher it, Jessica Loundis? Loundis? Lounds? Lounds, Lounds? Lounds? okay. Uh, she plays a stereotype female. I feel like I heard you comment on this at the Alleluia tour, uh, or maybe it was in the commentary or something, um, but uh, she plays stereotype that some might find offensive. Uh, have you received anything negative about her character? Uh, I or has has there been any grief that you've received from female groups or anything like that? Uh, I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, there definitely have been some, um, there's been some talk back and, and uh, some like button activists who <laughs> have disproved of it. But, you know, and then I've been asked the question quite a few times. I mean, I think the short answer is it, it's a personal hell. And I think that if you're paying attention the hell of the first Devil's Carnival is a personal hell. Mm -hmm. So she's putting herself through that and falling for the wrong men over and over again. So I didn't see it as as um, harshly as some as some of the critics have. But even uh, even if that's what's there and that's how people read it, I, I, I like the fact that people are talking about it and uh, that it's controversial because if it was safe. If you're doing something called the Devil's Carnival and it's safe, <laughs> you're a fucking asshole. <laughs> that I, I mean, it's well, you're very, probably pandering at that point. Yeah, it's very true. Um, sorry, uh, the I guess the the song for her wasn't as controversial, but like uh, the musically, when you're coming at something that you feel like might be pushing buttons, do you? I'm, I'm not going to say censor yourself because I know the answer to that because obviously you don't censor yourself. But is there is there some sort of consideration taken? Well, this could potentially piss somebody off. Should I'm I'm I am I going to change this lyric? Or, or you feel like you're yeah. walking on eggshells a little bit? The answer is no. I mean, I think that there's. I think the only consideration that we have is is this the best story that we can present, and is this the truest story that we can present? So. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a couple of songs in, uh, in, uh, American Murder Song that we've gotten a little bit of flack for some of the language in there. Um, but bottom line is that was the era, you know? Um, so I feel like you don't do anything for shock value because I just think that's, there's not a lot of point to that. Right. I mean, maybe there is, I don't think in what we do, there's a lot of point to that. But I think you really do push to to be honest, to write an interesting story. Um, but yeah, I don't think that censorship should really not come into it. You know, it's not. Um, I don't know. I just don't see it as something very valuable. Right. 
right. if it comes at the expense of telling a telling the story you want to tell. Absolutely. In fact, I think what we've dealt with more than self censorship is, especially with the filmmaking. Sometimes your ideas have to be censored, not by your choice, but because of budgets or timing yeah. or the actor, whatever they bring or don't bring to the table. So, um, and I think in the case of Tamara and the Scorpion and the Frog, that's actually a prime example. Uh, the original script, all the way up until shooting the scene, uh, got his in the end, the Scorpion did. Mm -hmm. um, and through the process of not having money and the director making difficult choices to go, well, what do we keep, what do we lose? Um, that was cut out. And so in every script, it was more true to the actual fable in the sense of the scorpion kills himself in the process of yeah. killing a frog. And that was lost. And I, and it's one of those things, like, when it happened, I didn't even think about how that changed the story in that way to make her just a victim and him not a victim of his own shit as well. Right. But, you know, that's part of filmmaking. And uh, as a script writer, you're you're at the mercy of whatever is edited or what the actor chooses to say or not to say or what the budget may allow. And sometimes your vision is changed, sometimes for the better, um, oftentimes for the worse, just due to limitations. You, you so it's actually been for... You were part of that process, though, with Boozman, weren't you? Like, as as he was directing it, you were there, active, no? Yeah, and, and it's not, I'm not, it, this isn't just a, a Darren thing. Right. Um, it's everything, you know? Sure. Like I said, it's the cast, it's what location do you have, it's, okay. is the visual effect or the prop working? Like, the scorpion dying was going to be a whole gag, blood gag, that just didn't work. Um so it's a combination of factors. Uh, and yes, in regards to probably the traditional screenwriter in Hollywood, um, or for that matter, lyric writer for a musical film, uh, Sarah and I have had a lot more input than is customary. But at the end of the day, you can offer your input, and then sometimes you're just told, well, here are the two choices. <laughs> Neither is great. Which one... Uh, which one would you vote for? Right. Yeah. And it shakes out how it shakes out. And again, sometimes it shakes out better. So you never know. But I think what's been exciting with American Murder Song, because we really did just endeavor this on our own, mm -hmm. the business, the whole thing, um, the limitations haven't felt... We've been able to creatively yeah. deal with the limitations without, without, without bureaucracy, one. Um, but I guess in a more pure way. So um, even when you asked about the lyrics to, or the music to, um, like, In All My Dreams I Drown, which is the Tamara song. Which is the most beautiful song I've heard probably in the last 10 years or so, Sar. It's, when you guys did it at, at the Wake in Denver, I, I, would, like, I was hoping all night that maybe you would maybe pull that out. And it was the first song you did. So thank you. Anyway, continue. I apologize. Well, no, well, thank, thank you. Um, but interestingly, maybe this even how it cuts both ways, like th that story got a lot of flack, the Scorpion and the Frogs, how it was presented in the movie. But on the other hand, that song is far and above the most popular song from the movie. And I'd even say the Scorpion is clearly a popular character. Yeah. Uh, maybe for the wrong reasons, but it, I think it just goes to show that there's, there's a warring nature, perhaps in all of us, and that is part of the personal hell aspect of the story. So nice. And I'll add one thing kind of an earlier point in this is that, <laughs> is that as far as censorship and I, and I actually even, we've been actually very lucky, especially with both with, with Carnival, especially uh, with American murder song. It's us running the whole thing. So there's nobody there to be able to censor us right. uh, <laughs> except for the audience by leaving. Yeah. Uh, which is, <laughs> purest form of censorship. Um, but, uh, you know, if you, if you think about it, we had, for Alleluia, we ended basically an hour and a half musical with a song in German. <laughs> you know? And we thought, this is a great fucking idea. <laughs> Nobody even questioned it. Nobody said, oh, can we have these lyrics in English instead? They're just like, here's the song, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> So we've been very lucky in that regard, is that we just get to, um, you know, there's very little of, of 
especially from the songwriting aspect. I think a lot of what you were talking about has to do with just natural concessions of the process, mm -hmm. you know. But as far as actual censorship of the work that we're doing, I think we've, especially with Carnival and, and obviously the MS, we have free reign, right. uh, you know. Uh, I mean, we censor each other, but that's part of the writing process, not uh, not at the end. Have you have you experienced any of that? The the audience like walking out because of offense or anything to the, of that nature. I, I, I can't, I, I would imagine if they're going into uh, the wake, you know, they know what they're in for by that point. They know what they're in for. I mean, I don't think so. Uh, not with American Murder Song. But look, you know, anytime you're doing something live, there are, there are great nights and there are not so great nights. Yeah. And sometimes, and that's the beauty of a live performance. It's never the same. So, you know, there were definitely nights where, you know, you, you could just tell people we're heckling more or we're drinking more, which maybe is even a sign of us <laughs> doing good. But when people start drinking, they start, you know, going crazy. And sometimes they're distracted by a shiny object on the other end of the of the room. Um, and you're trying to fight for their attention or to keep their attention. But no, I mean, I think if you showed up for the wake, you kind of knew that it was going to be yeah. edgy yeah. and uh, and and participatory yeah so uh if you if you just want to give us uh uh what's what what we're looking for coming up is it more murder song is it another separate project uh what's going on well we're not done uh and we're not done with american murder song and so um without giving too much away on the 5th of december uh, Sarah and I are going to have some very big announcements that we're going to be sharing with the world. So you definitely want to tune in to our website, American Murder Song, or any of our social media pages. Um, but there's more music coming. There's more stories coming. Beautiful. And, uh, and the tour was a wonderful success. And that's actually given us, more than anything, the confidence to keep going. So um, I guess we want to just thank everyone who came out and was a part of that. Uh, and anyone that wasn't able to because we didn't come to their city, well, we've got some big plans that hopefully will involve more of the world. So uh, check it out on the 5th of December. I, I, I look forward to that for you guys. Um, thank you again for sitting down with us. Uh, I, I seriously look forward to new music from you guys, from both of you. Uh, and uh, again, thanks so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks for watching our video, YouTube. Uh, if you like what you saw here, definitely check out some of our other videos. We talk about all kinds of different things, social issues, politics, uh, lighter topics like comic books and movies. Uh, generally, anything that piques our interest, we're going to put it on here. Yeah, and also don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, share. It really helps us out to get that information out there. We don't get any kind of monetary compensa compensation for this, so anything that you can do to help us spread that content around really, really helps. Facebook.com slash EclecticKidCafe. Like and share that content with your friends. Twitter, retweet us. Uh, our handle is at EclecticKidCafe. And subscribe to us on YouTube.